massive tsunamis, destructive tornadoes, giant meteorites, devastating earthquakes. Ooh, better have insurance. But all these are minor natural disasters compared with the eruption of a volcano. Some volcanoes can destroy a city, as it was with Pompeii, or some islands in the Pacific Ocean. But there's a dangerous type of eruption that can destroy all life on the planet. This type is called flood basalt. But first of all, let's figure out what a volcano is. Rivers of hot liquid metals and incandescent rocks flow deep inside our planet. And the deeper it gets, the hotter they are. The source of this hot mass is the mantle, which is the middle layer of Earth, located between the core and the crust. These fiery streams are called magma, and it flows everywhere. But we don't feel its heat because of the thick layer of our planet's crust. Magma is lighter than the crust, so it always tries to break out to the surface. And in some places, it succeeds. At the junctions of tectonic plates, it splashes out when one plate moves under a thicker one. When magma reaches the surface, it becomes lava. This substance burns the ground around and cools down quickly. It hardens and forms a new layer of rock. The following splash of magma falls on the top of this layer. Thus, a mountain appears layer by layer over millions of years. And in its mouth, a fault of tectonic plates splashes out magma. This mountain is called a volcano. It spits lava and ash into the sky, then falls asleep and wakes up again during seismic activity. Now imagine that several giant volcanoes begin to splash out an infinite amount of magma. It just doesn't end and covers an entire continent. This is a flood basalt. And one day, it did happen. About 252 million years ago, in the northern part of our planet, a lot of magma accumulated under Earth's crust. Trillions of tons of hot rock were concentrated in one place on a gigantic territory. And gradually, all this fiery energy began to seep out of the ground. Hot gas started to come out in different places in this territory. The ground shook endlessly, and the crust rose hundreds of feet all pointing to the approach of an imminent catastrophe. And then, at some point, magma began to pour out. Giant fountains of fire burst out of the ground. Do you know these geysers in Iceland? So imagine the same things, but dozens of times higher and with hot lava and ash instead of water and steam. The ash and lava flows were so strong that they reached the clouds. Under Earth's crust, there was a gigantic bubble of magma, and it squeezed out fiery jets under the pressure of rock and ground. The rift was getting bigger. Magma was flowing out everywhere. It began to fill the entire North continent. The flood of lava spread wider and wider. The streams of molten rock seemed endless. Layers of molten basalt rock overlapped one another, forming a giant tsunami of lava 160 feet high. It poured out of the ground for hundreds of thousands of years, flooding forests, rivers, lakes, and meadows. At the same time, billions of tons of volcanic ash rose into the sky, which could lead to a volcanic winter, since sulfur dioxide in the ash reflected the sun's rays. This might have lowered the temperature on the continent by several degrees. Then, dust and ash probably condensed and formed giant clouds that watered the surface with toxic acid rain. But after that, the cold lava formed a giant thick shield, preventing magma from seeping out of the endless fire bubble. The global catastrophe was over, but only for a short time. Trillions of tons of magma were still flowing under a thick layer of solid basalt. The fiery rivers couldn't reach the top, so they spread out to the sides. As a result of this expansion, huge nets were formed under the thick rock. They ran in different directions like a spider web and heated Earth's crust. Gases started coming out from under the surface again. More and more energy accumulated there, until an explosion of unimaginable force occurred. In addition to magma, carbon dioxide and ash escaped to the surface. They filled the atmosphere and caused the greenhouse effect. The temperature on the whole planet increased by several degrees. This release provoked another catastrophe that began in the ocean. There were deposits of methane, an explosive gas, on the seabed. Under ice-cold water, the methane was frozen and harmless. But the greenhouse effect in the atmosphere warmed up the entire ocean. 
millions of tons of methane began to rise to the surface. This gas is more potent than carbon dioxide. Therefore, when it hit the atmosphere, the temperatures on Earth increased again. The whole globe turned into a hot sauna. In previous cool and humid places, the temperature reached those of a modern Sahara. Of course, most animals and insects couldn't survive such a cataclysm. But ocean life took much more damage. The heat and methane reduced the amount of oxygen in the ocean. Fish and other marine life couldn't survive in such conditions. New problems appeared when anaerobic bacteria started to multiply in non-oxygen water. They fed on methane and carbon dioxide and released hydrogen sulfide, a toxic substance that poisoned water even more. About 75% of land animals and 95% of the ocean's inhabitants went extinct. This flood basalt eruption was the only disaster in the planet's history that destroyed almost all plants and significantly reduced the insect population. Several species of the hardiest animals managed to survive in these conditions. The planet took about 10 million years to recover completely. After that, evolution began a new process of developing life. And here are two pieces of news. The bad one is that flood basalt will happen again and will be no less devastating than 252 million years ago. The good news is that it will happen in hundreds of millions of years. But when that happens, humanity will need to be prepared. It will start on the ocean floor. First, lava fountains miles high will begin boiling the water and emit sulfur dioxide into the atmosphere, where it will reflect sunlight. Along with ash and magma, a massive amount of water vapor will rise into the air. Livestock won't survive, and people will have breathing problems. Acid rain and increased humidity caused by the evaporation of the oceans will lead to the corrosion of buildings. All flights will be canceled. People will have to wear gas masks. Many animals won't be able to handle this eruption, but humans will adapt quickly. But then another and another eruption will follow, and this endless catastrophe will soon deplete the resources of humanity. Plants and trees won't recover so fast, and oxygen production will be significantly reduced. Let's hope that humanity will have colonized other planets, including those outside the solar system by that time. And now, let's jump back to the present. Ah. About 70% of the seismic activity associated with volcanoes occurs underwater. So let's see how ordinary volcanoes on the ocean floor work. Water, as well as land, rests on tectonic plates. Therefore, if their structure is broken at the joints, magma seeps through them. But unlike terrestrial volcanoes, lava here doesn't spread in different directions, burning everything it meets. It solidifies under the pressure of cold water. Underwater volcanoes can erupt for a long time with breaks in between. Magma covers the seabed. After another hundred or a thousand years, a new eruption begins and a new layer of rock forms over the previous one. Over millions of years, layer by layer, magma is rising. And then, one day, a volcano rises out of the water. Magma splashes out of it and increases its height. And now, we have a large volcanic island. Then the volcano falls asleep, and life appears on the newly formed piece of land. Magma flows from the planet's mantle, filled with various chemical elements. This hot mix saturates the soil with useful substances, and thus promotes the growth of plants and trees. Then birds and other animals arrive there, and the volcanic island turns into a paradise. Then humans arrive and pave over paradise to put up a parking lot and a franchise burger joint. If there were cataclysms on Earth every 5 minutes, living conditions on our planet would be almost the same as 4.5 billion years ago. Back then, seas and oceans boiled, lightning struck everywhere, tectonic plates changed their shape, lava flowed from volcanoes, and worse, no internet. <laughs> the Earth resembled a vast boiling cauldron where life was gradually being created. If it starts to boil again, this cauldron could destroy almost all life on the planet. Hmm, consecutive cataclysms. Won't hurt to pretend. Let's imagine, shall we? Good morning! You wake up in a small underground bunker. The seismic sensor indicates that a 7-point earthquake will start in a few minutes. 
you pack a huge waterproof backpack and go upstairs. The underground bunker is protected from seismic activity. It moves with the ground, so you're safe here. But you need to leave the shelter because supplies are low. Also, yesterday, you picked up a radio signal telling all survivors to go south immediately. The coordinates they gave aren't far from your location. You have to hurry, though, before the landscape changes again. You open the hatch and find yourself in the middle of the desert. The sun is almost invisible beyond the gray sky. The ground is shaking, but you're not afraid. There are no houses or buildings, nothing to fall on you. You keep your balance perfectly, and the earthquake doesn't knock you off your feet. It's like jumping on a trampoline. The only danger is the deep chasms in the ground, but you can easily jump over them. After such an extreme morning warm-up, you decide to have breakfast. You take a tin can out of your backpack. You have a few minutes before the next disaster, so you eat and remember how your great-grandfather told you how all this started. Before all of this, the planet was divided into territories called countries. Millions of people lived in them, and then something terrible happened. The tectonic plates started to move, and the air temperature and atmospheric pressure began to rapidly change. In one day, earthquakes destroyed entire cities. Tsunamis and floods washed away the remaining ruins. Volcanic ash blocked the passage of sunlight. Forest fires destroyed almost all vegetation, and eruptions poisoned the air. Only a few people managed to adapt to such harsh conditions, and you are a lucky duck to be one of them. As you finish your breakfast, you're distracted by another ground tremor. Time to move on. Many people travel around the world alone, as they consider it a safer way of life. Some people form small communes, but no one ever stays in one place for too long. Your whole life is in motion, but you don't panic. One of the main rules during natural disasters is to remain calm, so all survivors have steel nerves and excellent physical training. You run a few miles south and suddenly smell something strange. You put on a gas mask. The earthquake has created a limnic eruption. Natural carbon dioxide is released from the ground to the surface. You feel comfortable in a gas mask, but can't run fast while wearing it. Far up ahead, you see a green forest, a rare place that was not affected by fires. You take off the gas mask and go to the tree to take shelter in the shade from the scorching sun. This green area is rich in vegetation. Colorful flowers, strawberries, and many other berries grow here. But you're concerned. Such fertile land comes from being near volcanoes. It spews underground magma rich in vitamins and minerals, so vegetation grows. You can see a high mountain in the distance. This is the volcano. An underground push occurs again and provokes an eruption. You gather strawberries and run away from this place as far as possible. Lava pours from the volcano's mouth and makes a fire in the forest. You unhook a folding scooter with a motor from your backpack and drive away from the fiery mountain as fast as you can. The sky is covered with volcanic ash, but this is not for long. A strong wind flows, grows with each passing second. You realize a hurricane is moving in your direction. You take out a small shovel and dig a hole in the ground. The soil is dry, but you have enough strength to dig a small ravine in a couple of minutes. You dive into the shelter and cover yourself with a protective tent. The hurricane blows the volcanic ash in different directions, and the air becomes clear again. But the fire doesn't stop. The wind spreads through the forest. You get out of the ravine and put on the gas mask again. There's a lot of smoke around, and it's unbearably hot. You know the hurricane couldn't just appear without any reason. Hurricanes are formed when warm, moist air collides with the sea surface and rises to the sky, so there's water nearby. Great, because you're thirsty and want to cool down. A loud sound erupts behind you. You turn around. A massive wave of water approaches the fire. Without panic, you take your life jacket out of your backpack, remove your gas mask, and put on a diving mask and fins. The wave blows you off your feet, but you don't drown. Over the years of survival, you have learned to swim very well. You grab a passing tree and wait patiently for the flood to be replaced by another natural disaster. For five minutes, you sail under a black stormy sky that sparkles with lightning. Despite the waves, you try to row south. It's getting pretty cold. You finally see the shore. 
But this is not a land, but ice. A strong wind brought a cold cyclone, which caused a fast temperature change. It's like you're in Antarctica. Snow and blizzards are all around. It's freezing, but you take out a thin space blanket made from foil and walk slowly south. Under your clothes, you put crumpled paper, bubble wrap, pieces of cotton. All this also helps to warm your body. Along the way, you collect several bottles of snow to melt later. Icicles form on your face, and you can't see because of the snowstorm. Suddenly, the snow begins to squish under your feet. The ice melts and turns into water. A hot stream of air blows into your face. You find yourself on hard, dry ground, looking up at the sky, then at your watch. Five minutes pass, and the sky is again covered with black clouds. You take a metal plate out of your backpack and cover your head with it. A few seconds later, you are hit by heavy rain and hail. Giant balls of ice knock on the metal shield, but you go calmly and even with a smile on your face. The ground becomes wet and loose from icy rocks. When the hail ends, you pull out all the heat-insulating materials from under your clothes and hide them in your backpack. Then you lay out a few long spokes of steel. The spokes are wrapped with copper wire. You connect the spokes to each other, making one long antenna. You stick it in the ground and run away. After the hail from the rain clouds, lightning strikes the ground. More precisely, it hits the lightning rod you've just built. You wait for the storm to end, then take the lightning rod apart and return it to your backpack. An intense heat begins. You drink some melted snow and break your way through the desert. The Earth trembles, and your adventure begins again. Earthquakes, carbon dioxide, fires, floods, snowfall, tsunamis, lightning, and again and again and again. With the help of a compass, you continue your journey and reach your goal a few months later. You see a long antenna sticking out of the ground. This is a place mark for entering an underground city. The city is built from dozens of massive bunkers connected to each other by tunnels. The city walls don't allow radiation to pass through, and they don't bend from daily earthquakes. People learn to extract energy from the ground. The Earth's core gives heat. This heat boils water, then steam is formed, and electricity is created at special stations. People get water from underground lakes and rivers. Instead of the sun, ultraviolet lamps are installed everywhere, which provide people and plants with necessary light. Natural disasters happen on Earth every five minutes. But humanity still has a lot of space underground. Rocks rolling down the slopes of a rumbling volcano, pushing other bigger rocks on their way, and eventually tumbling down into the ocean in a humongous cascade, causing a wave the height of which the world's never seen before. This is what might happen if the Helena slump of the Hawaiian Big Island falls off into the water. The Kilauea volcano is far from dormant. The latest eruption occurred in 2018. Its eruptions are usually accompanied by earthquakes of different magnitudes. And with each quake, the magma rocks on the slopes of the volcano shift down. These rock formations are called slumps, and the Helena slump is the most notorious of them all. In 1868, the shift of this slump caused a tidal wave rising as tall as 60 feet. But what's most troubling is that some 110,000 years ago, a landslide here led to one of the most powerful earthquakes ever, which in turn led to a mega tsunami of over a thousand feet in height. Scientists are worried that such an event may repeat in the future. If that happens, the wave might engulf the whole of Hawaii and easily reach both North and South American coasts. Geologists are quick to reassure, though, that a landslide like this is unlikely to occur anytime soon. It's just too early for that. But when it finally does, the consequences will be catastrophic. Have a nice day! Yellowstone National Park in the western USA is world-famous for its dazzling views, and especially the colorful Grand Prismatic Spring at its very heart. But we should all stay aware that Yellowstone is, first and foremost, an enormous caldera, basically a slumbering supervolcano. The difference between a regular volcano, like Kilauea from earlier, and a supervolcano is that the latter is thousands of times more powerful. Imagine an eruption spewing tons of huge rock and rivers of hot lava. 
pumping out clouds of ash that make countries stop air travel for weeks. And now multiply all of this by a thousand. This is what a Yellowstone eruption would look like. At first, a huge area in the middle of the national park would shake, crumble, and then blast upwards in a megaton explosion. Lava flows and magma rocks would cover the area of about 40 square miles, roughly half of Washington, D.C. But the greatest danger is the volcanic ash. The ashen plume would rise miles above and get carried by the wind in every direction. Since the eruption would be far from ordinary, the spread and damage would also be much greater than usual. The ash is thick and heavy, so it would cover a vast area in a blanket, destroying crops and even buildings. Worse still, it would spread in the air and block out the sun, leading to a drastic drop in temperature and an artificial winter. Even regular volcanoes can lower temperatures worldwide by a few degrees. A supervolcano may potentially cause a new ice age. Luckily, the chances of Yellowstone supervolcano erupting in the near future, or at all, are extremely low. There have been only three of those in the history of Earth, and there's no evidence such a disaster should repeat. Scientists estimate the probability at 0.00014%, which is lower than the chances of an asteroid wiping us all out. Speaking of which… If dinosaurs could talk, and were at least still alive for that matter, they'd tell you that asteroid threat is as real as it gets. Scientists at NASA say they've tracked 90% of all near-Earth asteroids of significant size, and none of them are a matter of any concern. But there are still the other 10% in the great unknown. What's more, asteroids can change their line of flight because of the pull of other celestial bodies and eventually turn our way. Lucky us! Now, if an asteroid big enough, like a mile across, hits the Earth, it will first cause an explosion powerful enough to erase a dozen big cities in a matter of seconds. Then the impact will raise a cloud of dust and debris that will block out the sun, just like the ash cloud from a volcano, and cause a centuries-long winter on the whole planet. But even if it falls into the ocean, which is more likely, a resulting wave will rise several miles high, washing coastal cities off the face of the planet. But at least there won't be a new ice age. Although scientists are pretty sure there's no such threat in the near future, it can't be ruled out completely, and humanity needs at least five years to prepare for this event. If a big near-Earth asteroid suddenly changes its course and turns right toward our planet, we won't stand a chance against it. Disaster movie, anyone? A much more probable calamity, though, rests right beneath our feet. It's the San Andreas Fault in California. The fault has been ready for rupture for years now, and scientists estimate that an earthquake along this line is likely to occur in the next three decades. And when it happens, it won't be nice. They expect a magnitude of 8.0, which is comparable to some of the most devastating quakes in history. It's all the more dangerous since California is home to some of the most populated cities in the western US, including Los Angeles and San Francisco. High-rise buildings are common there and they're particularly vulnerable against underground shakes. The San Andreas earthquake might cause a whole lot of damage both to cities and countryside. In the worst-case scenario, the ground might break apart, destroying buildings, farms, and changing the landscape altogether. Still, scientists believe that the probability of such a quake is only 7% for the next 30 years. So there's a rather big chance, um, 93%, that we'll never see that in our lifetime. Yet, there's another earthquake hazard not so far away from the previous one. The mega thrust in Chile. The country sits right above the subduction zone, an area where two tectonic plates meet and go one beneath the other. At the place of their meeting, stress is accumulated because of their continuous movement, and once that strain is too much, a major earthquake occurs. Chile has experienced a lot of quakes in the recent years, and scientists are worried those might be preparing the area for a really big one. They believe a great earthquake is due to happen before the end of the century, and it might be devastating to the coastal area. Even smaller quakes caused tsunamis that flooded the west coast, and a huge one like that is likely to raise a wave of incredible height. On the bright side, Chile now knows to prepare in advance for the coming natural disasters. And geologists are pretty sure people will be able to evacuate before the earthquake strikes.
In September of 1859, astronomer Richard Carrington was looking at the Sun and suddenly saw a bright flare on its surface. He made a note of it in his records, but only realized how important it was a couple of days later. The energy from that flare reached Earth and struck it directly, causing northern lights to appear above Cuba and burning telegraph lines all around the world. This was dubbed the Carrington Event, and it was a solar storm. Such storms hit the Earth fairly often, but none of them were so powerful as the Carrington Event, neither before nor after. But in 2012, astronomers registered a similar solar flare whose energy nearly hit our planet once again. If it had been just a week earlier, we'd have been in big trouble. Today, humanity relies on electricity in almost every aspect of life, and a powerful solar storm would mess with the electromagnetic field of Earth a lot. All electric appliances would either shut down or short-circuit, and huge transformers powering basically everything would go out of order for good. It would take years to repair them, and the cost of such a massive blackout would count in trillions of dollars. The worst of it is that science is almost unable to predict solar storms. And even if we could know about them in advance, we'd be powerless to stop them. The flare happens in a matter of seconds and it takes about 8 minutes for the particles to reach the Earth's atmosphere, causing the disturbance. The power outage would come a bit later, in a day or so, when a massive cloud of plasma gets to our planet. At the moment, there's no protection against solar flares, and the chances of one powerful enough to cut all of our electricity in the next few years are quite high, about 12%. The only good thing about all this is that we now know of such a possibility and can at least prepare in advance. Hey, don't forget to pack some underwear and socks, you'll always need those.